we have another external presenter uh, this morning. Uh, his name is Helgi uh, Stedman. He is a principal geologist uh, at uh, this and um, he studied the uh, metasomatism processes in uh, New Zealand at the University of Victoria. Uh, he came in uh, Australia in uh, 1998 uh, and started working in the uh, coal industry. Uh, from 1998, uh, he was involved in exploration, engineering, and uh, modeling. Uh, his topic is adding glass holes to exploration for improved coal recovery and modeling. Help me. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you everyone for coming along. I hope to impart some enth enthusiasm for this uh, topic that, um, that I have at, at uh, TEAS. Um, on a daily basis I, I get to work with this material and, and it, um, it really does <coughs> mean that I don't have uh, much work to do because I love this, this topic so much. So adding ball holes uh, blast holes to exploration, we have an exploration suite and we have, which is typically 200 metres apart, ball holes 200 metres apart for exploration, and then we have a blast hole which are typically 20 metres apart, so we have a very fine detailed amount of data, <coughs> and putting that into a very coarse arrangement of holes, and um, this presentation will show you the things that we can see. So exploration establishes what we have, and so we can start to do feasibility work. It means drilling, of course. Once we're mining, blasting um, is essential. It also means drilling. If one does not blast from an exploration hole, but with, with geophysics one may explore from a blast hole. Of course that's not in reverse, you can't uh, blast an exploration hole. But, uh, this presentation shows what is uncovered by logging glass holes in a coal environment. So I'll just take you through a few areas where TEAS works in the Bowen Basin. We have mines around Blackwater, uh, recently um, inherited a mine from Jalambar Plains and there's also Curra. There's Lake Vermont, there's Burton, and up here I've got an example from Collinsville. Uh, but recently we've inherited the Sonoma project. So I'll just have a look at a few dry facts first. What, what is a uh, blast hole? A blast hole is a, a 29 centimetre diameter hole where we charge with ANFO. Um, I instruct a certain number of holes to go through the base of the coal and that's so that the geophysics when run can see the floor of the coal, and so we have a roof and a floor that is easily seen in the geophysics. Typically, though, blast holes will stop above the coal. So, why log blast holes? And that's to create an accurate roof model. And with an accurate roof model, we can then start to protect the coal roof. And that's all about placing the charge in the right place, because if we don't place it in the right place, it's gone to smithereens. Only then can you consider dig design, equipment selection, machine guidance, and stripping method. It all starts with putting the charge in the right place. Once, once that's there, then you can start to look further on forward at these, these items. So let's have a look at a few um, the setup of, of the benches at Lake Vermont. Um, and these thick lines. These thick lines uh, represent the holes. So angled here for the, the angle of the high wall, um, but in the middle here we have a, a vertical. So I, I, I collect data from each, each of these holes, separated by 60 metres. And so we, we're stripping to the Leichhardt scene and to the Vermont scene. This is a mid-strip set of holes, pre-split pre, pre line, flanks the, the block which is in question. So here's a look at the, the 
drill rig drilling the vertical holes. This is the, the floor of the light arc. And once, once the model is made, once the, the roof is, is created, then the drill rigs can start to produce the holes for the overall cast shot. When I say cast shot, when I, when I talked about stripping method before, a method can either be cast or we can dig it off with a shovel. But this is a particular method to cast this rock away. <laughs> okay, we're going to have a look at the, the, some geophysical traces from, from the glass holes. Um, probably, probably got to hit the lights on this one. It's the top one. Top one? No. with respect to the roof 
and in this section there is very little respect to the roof, the charge is, is a lot lower. And so you'll notice here that the, the coal comes out like a set of drawers, whereas the, the coal here stays in situ as this starts to starts to uh, cast away because the charge whoop, charge is going to place at a point above the coal where there is no movement here, very little movement. When we get to here, you'll see this piece of coal get lost. It's starting to move away. This is a great demonstration of putting the charge in the right place with respect to the roof of the coal. I want to have a look at the thickness variation, the sort of things that we can pick up in, um, to our model. I'm going to move away from um, putting the charge in the right place now and just look at the thickness variation here is very, very regular and boring, predictable for a geologist. So far, it's very still interesting though. Sometimes it gets weird. And yes, I can start to squint at that and wonder what the hell is going on in that situation. In fact, this is a, a thrust fault plane running, running at an angle more like this. It's not, if you're looking at the high wall, this is, this is an oblique boat over that, that track, that uh, face of rock there is, is the angle of the thrust coming in. At Angle. Here you can see pre split hole barrels that will come through to assist with the um, removal, with the exposure of that, of that batter. So, how the question is how do I protect, or how do we protect the coal that, that is in that situation? When I'm presented with, not to turn this off again. Second, oh, second plot is an object time. One more? One more. One more. Okay. This is a situation where we have a blast hole with regular geology. Here's a Yarrabee top. This is a Vermont scene. Another hole has actually intersected nearly twice or over twice as much Vermont as there is in this hole. And in here it's repeated, like so. The point here is to protect, always protect the roof, so this is going to be one point in the, in the model. Here's the other point, and here's the other point. And looking at the high wall, this is looking straight onto the high wall with, with our pre-split sweep. The blue is, is the coal, you can see, you can see that the thrust plane and the Yarrabee Tuff in here, repeat Yarrabee Tuff here. Um, you start to see the plane thrust over the football of, of this Vermont scene here. See a, mi a minor um, splinter or thrust in here. And when I rotate that, I'm going to rotate that um, to the right. Looking, you start to build up a, a nice uh, three dimensional uh, model for this roof. So, again, the top, let's go back. The top um, is important, so the model will, the, the charge depth will be here, and then when it gets to here, it will drop down. So, in here, it will just be unblasted. So, one, we strip that. Bit of rock and that bit of rock. We're still left here with a bit of hard rock, which will be taken care of with, with ripping. So here, this, this is going to look at the situation with exploration holes separated in this section. Um, this is about a, a 
the 60 meter separation is giving up to 150, 200 meter separation. This is a bench of Leica, so that's 120. Um, and here we have a, a clue for Vermont, Mont, Mont Leica up here, and Leica up here. You can see that the, the mid burden thickness is twice, or well, nearly twice, um, that thickness there. So you can see something's happening to over thicken that mid burden. There's a regular mid burden here. The roof that you would expect in an exploration situation would be something like that. You'd be okay to model a roof like a Vermont roof like that. So when we come along here with our drill rig, they'll be going down targeting that scene. And, and what they do, they go down and they go, well, I'm not a pit pole there while I pull up. They, 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 suddenly all, all the chips coming back up from, from the hole of black. Um, that's not matching that route, uh, that, that uh, model. Um, so they'll, they'll, put, they'll adjust um, and then go, go further into their pattern and then, and then go again and then notice it's not it's still going black and then they, they might ring up the engineer and say that model's wrong. Um, further, further up here they might be going um, expecting coal and it's not coal and so they go down again. So what you're left with is a potted roof for a charge. So it would be going along then down, he was the, the drill would be checking for the roof. Uh, it, be a, it might go into the floor, into the roof itself. Um, and then as they, as they go merry along, along here, I'm thinking, well, that, there it is. They'll be leaving all, all this rock behind to be unblasted. So you get a potted, inconsistent drill floor targeting that roof. When I say drill floor, it's the, the, the depth, the bottom of the hole, which is the floor of the, the drill. That's what this is the this is the uh, the drill holes that you're presented with, which is bear no relation to the Vermont model here. So what I do is I integrate the expiration thread and and this sweep ball holes. What's happening here? You're getting three repeats in this thrust situation. So now the model, the roof model is, is like this. So the driller in here can, can be working away and we get a, a nice consistent drill for targeting that, that coal roof. And then we can start to model the thrust plane through here. And this in fact, when I give this to the, the drill and blast engineers, this is approximately the, the region where you'll get a repeat. And, and there it is in the, uh, in the actual situation. So here again, this is the roof I was talking about, leaving behind that one blasted rock there. But that's okay because we can take care of that when we come back, when we strip this top piece off. So looking at, in plan view, um, the drill hole spacing on the, on the left here is, is a locks line, and this is where, on this side, this is where the, the Vermont scene becomes um, split. So this is all Vermont seen as one, and here it's the last one. So you, you've got expiration uh, spread. You can see that there's a cluster of holes in here because they found a, an intrusion, so I just wanted to single that out. Um, the blue lines represent the faults. This is a union of radii which is equivalent to the what the contract says for us is um, adequate drilling to define the geology. But what we do, what we, when we start to overprint the thickness variation that we're getting from that spread of, of exploration, we're getting these anomalies. And particularly along the thrust faults, we're getting repeat, repeat seams. And in here, this might be a normal situation, a uh, normal fault situation where the seam has been Attenuating. Up here, for example, is, oh, no, it's a normal fault. And then, strangely enough, it's a repeat there. So you can imagine trying to reconcile what's going on in here. Um, the, these, what I call hot spots, are not, they're not being um, confined.
defined by the expiration spacing. And this is the intrusion I was talking about before. So just looking at, um, just changing subject, but the volcanic effects that we have uh, in, in the coal. This is from Collinsville. This is the top of the scene, of the, the black scene. And these cells, represented by these oval eggs as they're talked about in the field. And what you'll notice is in here, when I zoom in, there's the roof of the last ply, which is economic. But the, the colour is changing in here. The colour is trying to change from, this is more vitronite, less vitronite here, so it's gone greyer. So what's happening is you're, you're losing your volatiles and it's losing its economic value. I can see the difference um, between a higher vitronite and a lower vitronite um, signature and the density. In fact, we've lost that much coal. If that, if that got into the product, there would be a, a specification problem and a possible rejection. You can see the, the ambient heat is, is leached into that, that roof in an interesting kind of way. Um, looking at the different pit in Vermont, it's called North Pit. This is our spread of expiration. And what we're going to do, we're going to look at an area in here. The blue is a spread of glass holes that I have to integrate. So I have a, a greater knowledge now of the green expiration and the blue glass holes. I'm going to look at this little patch in here because these green glass holes show that there was an intrusion there, but Two isolated boreholes showing intrusion is not really enough to make a call to say, well, we need to move this top um, of our drop cut. Well, this, is, this is where we start. This is um, not dug to dug. So we start digging from here. We go down at an angle and we target the seam which is further out from the crest. But two boreholes here, would that be enough to make a call to say, no, I don't think that crest should be here, that's um, too aggressive. We want, we want to actually move further and we want to avoid two boreholes. Should we do that based on two, two points? I don't think so. So that's why the crest was put here prior to the blast holes. When you put the blast holes in here, it paints a different picture. We're zooming into this, this area of intrusion. We're going to look at a transect in these glass holes, so 95 metres. And this, um, this hot spot has overprinted the Permian coal measures. Um, and this is a, a dolerite, um, Cretaceous in age. It reminds me of uh, what I studied at, at Victoria uh, University, where you have a, a schist overprinted, uh, a schist ordivision is overprinted by a Cretaceous granite. And if you now consider this as a schist environment, you have a biotite from out here and a biotite from in here. The biotite here is going to be high in iron, which is like a, an anite end member. And then here you have a phlogopite end member because the iron has been taken up by the, the, the pyrite. Um, so, but in here it's in the coal environment, it's the vitronite, which is giving up its volatiles at the expense of the heat. So looking at each hole, the density from F, E, D, C, V, A, A is up here. So you can follow this navy blue density and see, see it gradually start to change. Here it's you can almost say that, that you can, so that's obliterated, and here there's no evidence of coal. You can only really just make uh, assumptions that the gamma, the, this red gamma, is kept, starting to kick to the right. There's something muddy underneath the, uh, the Vermont sand. So what's happening here? We have a vitronite being replaced by 
inerta knife. It's not as complicated as, as the biotite giving up its iron. It's, it's just simply old wood being burnt, uh, turned to charcoal. But you can see less dense and more dense in the coal. So you can start to draw it with a spread of overall boreholes. You can draw up a, an aureole and then advise the engineers that, in fact, we're, we're experiencing a, a, a rather bigger intrusion than we first thought. It's a two-dimensional slice, slice, so I can, I can draw up that in three dimensions. So this is our mine plan. Had um, we just known that these two boreholes were, were uh, intruded. So the mine plan, start, you start digging here and you, you're target here. Taking that grey away. So here's our boreholes. Assume, assume a dike situation rather than a more of a lack of general um, intrusion environment. So if, with two boreholes, you can you can say, well, let's let's target the seam out here. We're going to get this get this um, this coal in here and in here because this has been confined to two holes. We should be okay. Um, but what what it has shown is that blast holes have created an aureole which is far greater than just the two, bars, no, two, two exploration holes. So we adjust the target. So we let go of this false coal because this is all being true. It's uneconomic. And for just the toe to here, further down bit, we're saving the client um, vast expense from stripping all that waste rock away or no payback. So here are um, some numbers. Just to look at, uh, going back to the thickness difference. This is a, a thickness plot. Um, in plan view, two different strips, same strips here. This is with the blast holes, the thickness variation, uh, and without blast holes, the thickness variation. These numbers represent the tons that would come out of here on a model developed from this drill hole spacing. Strip one would give you 100,000 to 125,000. If we consider that something more close to reality is a, is a drill hole spacing um, more akin to 20 meters, this is what is actually there. Not, not, not exactly, but it's, more, it's closer to what the reality is. So we're going to reconcile back to exploration. And when we go and mine in here, I'm going to assume we're only as good as 96% of what is there anyway. Assume that these numbers represent what is there. So 96% of what is there is 96% of these two numbers. And so when we mine strip one and reconcile against a thickness model as determined by exploration, we've come up with 800 more tons, with our 800 plus, than what was predicted by exploration. So we can say to the, the mining superintendent, what we're, whatever we're doing in that strip is good, uh, we're not losing any coal. So when you get to the next strip, keep doing what you're doing. But lo and behold, because there's a bit of a, a thickness increase, this hotspot I was talking about, we only get 96% of what, what is there, 96% of 119,000, 114,000, but this interpolation is creating a false sense of how much coal is there. There's not 125,000 tons there. There's more like 119,000 tons there because that's how that's the number that's developed by all. So we, we extract 114,000 using the same method that we did in strip one. This time we're finding well we've just lost 10,000 tons against a model which predicted 125,000. If we look at the 20 meter spacing, well, in fact, we, we lost 4,200 in that, in that if, we, if we consider now that our model is 105,000, and we took out 100,800, we're, we're down 4,200, and then we can say to the superintendent, whatever we did in that strip was bad, we need to adjust our stripping method raise our charge or change change the tools, change the truck shovel, whatever. 
Some may use the challenge to be more sort of vision. So let's let's make a difference. Let's go from 96 to 98, and, what, and whatever change we made uh, is 98 percent of what is actually there. And this time we've taken out 116,000, whereas if we had made no change before, we would have lost 4,700. This just demonstrates um, reconciling against drill hole spacing, which is coarse, and reconciling against the drill hole spacing, which is, has detail. And so in summary, the objective of the geological model is to act like, accurately reflect true bonus reconciliation. That's what I was just talking about. In the integrated blast hole and the exploration model better reflects the true mining performance. So in the previous slide, had we known uh, the correct number to, to target, we could have made an adjustment. And the blast holes, of course, create uh, an accurate roof to be modeled and make my life a lot more interesting to work.
it's not instantaneous. Like I have to be sent. I have to email the, the, the file, the ASCII file, and then create the uh, the squigger line, if you like, and then make the interpretation off that line. So th there is delay um, in getting the information back, so four hours. So the modeling happens back at your main head office or the main you know, computer doing all the modeling back at the office, not in the fields. That's right. Yeah. It's just um, the geophysicist will pick up the information and then has to drive back to the point where he can communicate that data back to me. Also, the surveyor has to pick up the, the top of uh, the collar of the hole, exactly where it is in, in XYZ. So once I know where we start, then I know how far down the collar is, and I know where, where the, the hole is deviated to. So everything is as, as much precision as I can gather. So these, these ones we go through the floor of the collar. You've got the exploration drilling. Now you do some infilling. Do you do a planned infilling of a few of these to get the resolution before they do the main drilling? Is that how it works? That's right. We're, where we um, can track the complicated thrust zones, we can um, indicate, request a, a tighter spacing. Um, where it's boring predictable geology, it's just more like every 20 metres. And that's just to, to go. So you've got 60 metre strips bounded by high walls. Uh, and then along at the strike of the high wall, it's 20 metres, which is probably a bit of overkill and where it's uh, boring regular geology. But it can be very complicated. So what happens to those holes that you have drilled all the way through? Are they still used as a blast hole? Do they fill the bottom to stop the charge going? So the they do for, for pre-split, because the pre-split hole is, is not a highly charged yeah. hole. Um, but the vertical holes are uh, backfilled right up to the top. So those holes are purely for the exploration of, of that accurate roof. Okay, so do they fill it with drill chips or something to get it back up? Yeah, we've got stemming. Stemming that comes with stemming. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like a trip hazard. You want to fill it up? Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, it's very interesting work. So with these extra holes, have you looked at them? Then obviously it's a cost-benefit analysis being done to look at the extra drilling and the time of the geophysical logging versus the hole coverage that you're doing. The, the cost-benefit would be we have a contract where we didn't do it and we have a new contract where we are doing it. Um, it's an open and shut case. Where, that where we are doing it, we are um, achieving the contract uh, target call. Nothing detailed uh, has been done, but we have a, a suite of reconciliations before we did it, and a suite of reconciliations after. Um, and it, it's an yeah, open and shut case that it's uh, beneficial. There's one question there. Simply to uh, ask, uh, how does how do your practices do you think compare with the general industry approach to this to this problem of uh, defining coal roof? I'm, I'm unaware of any other uh, contractor or, or owner um, defining the roof. Um, so I think to compare, I don't know. Others do uh, attempt to define a roof, to my understanding, but I'm not aware of anyone who is under the same incentive as you guys are. So, uh, what you're doing is, is, is in the direct response to a strong commercial incentive. Yeah. So, you've got very good accuracy now on the coal roof. Have you tried or considered developing a blast index so to consider the whole into the instead of just the coal roof to improve or save costs, for example? Um, you're talking about altering the. the well, for example, you showed how they had a mudstone roof um, where you didn't need as much energy to blast you. Yeah. Have you considered mapping the entire roof to, say, manage your blasting costs? Um, 
you know, that's not my department, but I, I can um, I can advise on, on the, the charge placement, but it is possible to, to map that mudstone. Um, and it has a, a lateral mappable extent. You can see it in exploration as well. Um, that's a that's another task. Maybe that's a <coughs> subject for a paper. Uh, are there any other questions? No? Well, I would like to invite you for uh, coffee and biscuits, and actually, if you have other questions, you can ask Ali outside. So, one more time, I would like to thank you.